uh, Tenakoto Katoa. Um, it's very nice to be here. Um, uh, um, I've had a long term interest in, in housing and um, housing history and housing policy. And I guess over the last few years I've been um, wondering what the future of. Um, I'll come a bit closer so you can hear <laughs> what the future of social housing is. And um, it's really nice to see that so many people in New Zealand are engaged in looking at that. And I think you're in for a very exciting day. Um, what I'm going to do today is more sort of a policy history. I'm looking less at the sort of social history of um, social housing. <laughs> um, but I think you'll find over the course of the next few minutes that there's many themes in the history of social housing that have resonance today. Um, things that they're struggling with in terms of affordable housing in the 19th century, um, we don't seem to have um, solved yet, or they've come back to, to haunt us. So, I'll just begin by... There are three main ideas that, um, that sort of come out of a, of a history of social housing. One is that private enterprise has been a deficient provider of both affordable and good quality housing, necessitating, two, the intervention of governments in the housing market to increase supply, and three, um, left-leaning governments have focused on direct assistance, normally social housing or state housing, right-leaning governments have concentrated on indirect assistance. These are normally housing subsidies like um, state advances, loans, and so on. So I'll just begin by looking at the colonial experience um, in the 19th century. The laissez-faire political economy of the 19th century meant housing provision was left to private enterprise. Most New Zealanders are either most New Zealanders either rented their homes, or um, uh, most New Zealanders either rented their homes or owned it themselves. Um, in cities, in the main cities, renting dominated. The state restricted its role to regulating the housing market. For example, following evidence that high cholera and typhoid rates in inner cities was linked to overcrowding, backyard night soil heaps and miasmas, or poisonous gases, from leaking sewers, local councils were given powers to prevent overcrowding and filthy housing. Oops, sorry, go back to that one. Um, but due to the prevailing laissez-faire ethos, these measures were rarely used. Um, I think it's really interesting, particularly in terms of public health officials, um, of which there are many here. Um, one of the concerns of the 19th century public health reformers was um, in terms of overcrowding, particularly in inner city areas. Um, and that was strongly linked to sort of ideas about um, the spread of disease and the prevalence of this idea of miasmas or poisonous gases. And, for example, um, when it rained in Wellington um, and the sewers filled, um, gases from the sewers came up through the sewers and into areas like Tiaro, and there were high admission rates to Wellington Hospital. And public health officials would say, well, that was because the, poisonous, the gases were poisonous. Um, other explanations could include that the backyard soil, night soil heaps, that's human excrement, because that's where people used to dump it, um, probably got diluted um, during the rain and um, people would touch it and, or, or um, it have water that was um, infected by it. So, um, so councils were given these measures, but for, um, due to the prevailing laissez-faire ethos, they were yearly used. The 1890 election of the reformist Liberal government led to a more interventionist line. Growing concern over slum-like housing conditions and extortionate city rents led to reformers to claim that the market was failing to deliver good quality and affordable housing. They argued that New Zealand should follow Britain and erect council rental homes for city workers. In, 18, in 1900, the government gave local councils that power, but they were too busy building streets and sewers so the state took the lead instead. Um, I just make a reference to the photo you can see here. This is of um, Tiaro and Wellington, um, actually in the 1940s, but it shows the type of housing that was prevalent um, in central city areas, not only in Wellington, but also in Auckland and Dunedin, and to a lesser extent Christchurch. Um, quite high density, um, small backyards, um, and, uh, and there'd be, often in cases, families of sort of eight or nine living in those types of houses. So if there was, um, if there, if there was illness or disease, you can see how quickly it could spread. So, the first state houses. 
1905, the Premier Richard Seddon pushed through legislation enabling the state to erect 5,000 workers' dwellings in the main cities. The first houses were completed in Petone the following year. Um, this is Patrick Street in Petone. Um, if you go up there today, most of those houses are still there, even though they're in private ownership. By 1910, nearly, th um, sorry, um, however, Distance from city workplaces and high rents due to the superior construction standards deterred tenants and the scheme was not successful. Um, what happened, it was aimed at inner city workers, but by the time workers had come from Petone into town, um, they had to pay their um, commuter train fares and so on, walk a long distance. Um, you know, a lot of their uh, discretionary income was spent on that. Um, also, the Liberal government wanted to raise the standard of housing, so these were really solid and well built, um, but also expensive. And because um, rents were based on a cost recovery, a cost recovery basis, um, workers couldn't afford to rent them. Seddon's successor, Joseph Ward, favoured home ownership. He set up a scheme offering low interest state loans for land owning workers to erect their own houses. By 1910, nearly 1,300 loans had been taken out compared to the erection of just 126 workers' dwellings like these. The opposition reform party opposed state landlordism, lord, landlord, landlordism. When it came to power in 1912, it ended the first state's venture into social housing by selling the workers' dwellings. And then you, this sort of begins the cycle where you get conservative governments that will sell state houses, encourage self-reliance and so on, um, and you'll get Liberal governments that will build social housing. The Liberal government's venture into housing provision, while unsuccessful, provided the basic model for future state intervention. This involved two major forms of housing assistance. The erection of state rental houses, direct assistance, the state, and two, the state funding of private housing, indirect assistance. During the 1920s, the government promoted indirect assistance through 95% loans from the State Advances Department for new suburban homes. Um, so areas like um, Point Chev in Auckland, um, uh, Miramar in Wellington, um, and I can't remember for Christchurch and Dunedin, I'm sorry, but those 19 to St Albans, for example, in Christchurch, um, those areas had um, got state, uh, state advances loans. So a 95% um, state mortgage is pretty generous. New bungalows sprung up across former fields as home buyers rushed to realise the dream of home ownership. By the end of the decade, the state was financing nearly half of all new homes being built in New Zealand. The 1930s depression burst the suburban housing bubble. Lenders foreclosed on mortgage defaulters, forcing many back to renting their recently left inner city hovels. With new state housing building at a standstill, overcrowding in the main centres became acute. So, I mean, I just discussed briefly um, uh, this tenure graph. If you can see um, from um, 1916 to 1926, in the rented um, section, the blue line, there's a sudden drop off um, in terms of people renting and a build up of um, uh, people in owner occupied at that period where um, you've got the state advances loans coming through. Um, and then with the depression um, coming through in 1936, um, it, uh, between 26 and 36, it increases in terms of renting again as people returned. To their, um, to their inner city homes that they've recently left. Well, the coalition government, the conservative government that was in the 19, early 1930s, believed that private enterprise would solve the problem. But the Labour opposition blamed it on market failure and argued only the state could fix it. When it became government in 1935, it drew up plans to use private enterprise to build 5,000 state rental houses across New Zealand, so a return to direct housing assistance. A new Department of Housing Construction would oversee building, and the State Advances Corporation would manage the houses. The scheme was aimed to give the jobless a trade, so solve the unemployment problem, boost manufacturing industries. There was concern that um, 
uh, and, and the particular of the Labour government at that time, they wanted to increase local manufacturing, again to provide jobs and make um, New Zealand less reliant on overseas imports um, and increase the balance of, um, balance of trade in New Zealand's favour. Also, again, as in the, in the Liberal Workers' Dwelling Scheme, they wanted to raise the standard of New Zealand houses. They wanted to make sure that their state houses weren't described as slums. Um, they were going to increase the quality of New Zealand housing. And they also wanted to give tenants security of tenure equal to home ownership. So in the past, where tenants constantly had to move on because the landlord would sell the property or increase the rent so it was unaffordable, um, in state housing, a tenant would be able to stay there for all their life. Um, and I know that's been questioned in recent times, um, but that certainly was the ethos of the first Labour government. They wanted to build, um, basically, a social housing stock comparable to those in Europe, um, where people rented, um, most, many, many city dwellers particularly rented for most of their life. So, Labour's um, programme was aimed at low to middle income nuclear families, partly to encourage breeding. Um, there was a concern, particularly in the 1930s, that New Zealand was becoming too depopulated. They thought by providing um, cosy homes um, that would encourage um, young couples to have families. Um, rents were set on a cost recovery basis, which priced state houses beyond the reach of the poor again. At the same time, Labour strengthened existing rent controls to benefit the poor. So rent controls were put on those inner city properties, um, and so landlords could only um, charge a certain amount of rent that was determined as being affordable by the government. Um, typical of the state house families were the McGregors of Wellington, two adults and two children, a boy and a girl, um, who moved into the first state house in suburban Marama in September 1937. I'm sorry, I thought I did have an image of them moving in, but I couldn't find it when I was compiling um, the slides. But this is the sort of typical um, state house family um, in suburban uh, Miramar. Well, by 1939, state houses were being completed at a rate of about 57 per week. And there were 10,000 applicants for state houses on the waiting list. The Second World War halted building until 1944, after which whole state suburbs, such as Nainai, shown here in the bottom corner, were constructed. Um, the other thing about Nainai um, was that there was a strong environmental determinism going on, and that was the idea that, uh, again, if you built homes um, around a central community centre, um, I don't know if many of you are familiar of, of Hillary Court out there in Nainai, but that was the first New Zealand's first pedestrian wall, um, and the idea that people would go there in the evening to a community centre, play courts or um, basketball and become a focal for community life, a focus for community life. And that was a strong part of social housing programme during that period, not only in New Zealand, um, but also overseas, of creating a strong sense of community through design. Well, at the end of the 1940s, there was a backlash against state housing. Rents were only covering uh, um, only half the cost of new state houses. That meant that middle-income state housing tenants received hefty state subsidies, while the poor paid market rents for private rentals of lower quality. Labor said that raising rents would breach its security of tenure promise, but the wider public saw the situations unfair. During the 1949 election, the National Party exploited this disconsent and said it would provide tenants with the opportunity to buy their state houses, and it won in the landslide. Basically, there's a sense that you had all these middle class people living in areas like Nainai or um, uh, Tamaki in Auckland, um, and they were getting subsidised rentals from the state where, in fact, um, they could actually afford to rent their own houses or even buy their own houses. Um, that was the feeling. Well, in the 1950s, the national government rejected state housing as a mainstream form of tenure. So they overturned the Labour thing of creating a new form of um, rental tenure in New Zealand, seeing it instead as a provision only for those unable to afford to house themselves. It introduced an income limit for new tenancies, filtering out middle class applicants, and tightened allocation criteria to favour those most in need. National championed home ownership, believing it was the aspiration of most New Zealanders, 
that quickly moved to allow state housing tenants to buy their homes and raise the number of state advances loans for private house building. By 1954, state home loans accounted for 34% of all new home mortgages. Demand for housing continued to outstrip supply. So going back to that 1920s policy, rather than building social housing, though they still did build um, state housing, I should say, they were focusing on private provision. Um, and I just want to, this graph is, is quite interesting, I think, <laughs> because it shows the sale of um, state houses from 1953 till near the present. And it shows that basically um, national-led governments um, tend to favour the sale of houses. So there's a huge spike when um, the Holland national government introduced state house sales um, in those first years. It drifted off, which concerned the government. <laughs> um, the national Labour government in the 1950s um, reduced it. Um, during the 1960s, the national government, there were sort of various peaks where they sold and didn't sell. Um, the most interesting thing here, I think, um, for the Labour government is that the Kirk government in the early 70s actually increased the sale of state houses, um, which goes against the general idea that, that Labour governments um, don't sell state houses. Uh, and I think that might be partly because they thought that the housing pro crisis was solved and they wanted to encourage um, home ownership. Um, then through to the 1980s, initially the Roger Douglas Longy government continued to sell state houses. And I suspect um, when Helen Clark became housing minister, um, uh, she stopped the sale and you can see a dramatic plunge. And then through the 1990s, <coughs> um, huge increase under the um, Bolger government. And then when Clark came back in in 1999, a huge drop off again. Um, well, I should say that the um, Labour government of 1957-60 continued to support home ownership in 1959, gave low-income families the right to capitalise their family benefit. A family benefit was something that was paid to all families, it was universal benefit in New Zealand to all families, um, depending on the number of children you had. Um, and you could capitalise that and use it to, um, as a mortgage uh, deposit on a house. Together with low interest state mortgages, this enabled many low income families to become homeowners. Between 1951 and 66, the national rate of home ownership rose from 61% to 69%, um, which is a pretty significant um, increase. Well, to further meet demand, the state built most, most housing suburbs at Porirua, north of Wellington, and South Auckland. These were meant to be a blend of state and private housing but the state housing was concentrated in particular areas. The requirement for state housing to provide for the neediest created low-income communities, which from the 1960s included groups of urbanised Māori and Pacific Island peoples. These communities often experienced social problems associated with poverty and deprivation, changing the wider perception of state housing communities from desirable places to live in to undesirable places. And I think um, many of you will recognise um, shots like that was often appeared in the media um, showing the um, condition of state housing um, during the 1970s. Well, in the 1970s, the government believed the housing shortage was largely solved. Well, it continued to lend to low-income home buyers, buyers its focus changed to promoting private sector lending. In 1984, a reforming Labour government deregulated the banking sector, increasing the number of players in the mortgage market. It also stopped the Family Benefit Capitalisation Scheme and introduced market rents for higher income state house tenants to encourage them to seek private accommodation. So there's a, a strong withdrawal from um, indirect assistance in terms of housing subsidies and um, you know, research that I looked at um, earlier this year and Stopping the family capitalisation benefit was a huge hit, particularly for low-income families, um, and which made housing um, increasingly unaffordable, at least home ownership for them increasingly unaffordable. In 1991, a new national government extended market rents to all state houses' tenancies and introduced a rental subsidy, the accommodation supplement, for all low-income households. National believed that this system was better because it treated public and private sector tenants equally. 
However, many state housing tenants could not afford the market rents, um, even with the accommodation supplement, and were forced to cut back on food and other necessities, or live in overcrowded conditions, with, um, as Philippa and Michael have shown with their research, severe public health repercussions. So you get a huge increase in terms of um, diseases. Um, National also increased state housing sales. When a Labour government took office in 1999, it reintroduced um, income-related rents. Oh, look, I'll just, sorry, I'll, I'll, I'll miss this. Look, I just want, this is a Tom Scott cartoon. Um, during the 1990s, um, uh, uh, Ruth Richardson and Jenny Shipley um, promoted this idea of um, state housing tenants must become more self-reliant. They must um, be more dependent on their own resources. Um, and one way to do that was in the introduction of market rents. Um, and this is Tom Scott satirising um, that particular mentality or ethos um, during that time, um, which is right on the money, as many people, uh, well, I, I certainly um, believe. National also increased state house sales. Oh, when the Labour government took office in 1999, it reintroduced income-related rents, so that was based on 25% of a tenant's income, stopped state, state house sales and announced plans to construct further state houses. Um, and that graph there is, is showing um, basically over the period of since state housing was started by the first Labour government, um, an increase in the total housing stock um, with a few bumps during, um, again, that first period of the national government, the Holland National Government, where it came down, um, the um, Holyoke National Government in the 1960s continued to increase state housing. This is areas where Porirua and South Auckland were built, um, but then towards the end of their administration dropped back. Um, the, uh, the, uh, the 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 Longy government um, uh, increased state housing again, but then a huge drop off um, during the Bolger um, Shipley Richardson government, where huge amounts of state housing were sold off, um, well over 10,000. And then from the um, from the uh, Clark government in the 1990s, a return to building state housing, uh, something that, that, that the um, present government is, is continuing with. I understand. Okay. Um, I should also say something about council housing. <clears throat> um, in the early 1990s, city councils in the main cities followed the central government's lead and became more interventionist, believing private enterprise had failed in the delivery of some services, um, so from public transport to town milk supply. Um, councils either took them up, took them, took, took, either took them over or set up in competition. So this is a period where um, city councils started um, having their own milk, um, uh, milk um, what are they called? Um, milk processing centres in the centre of town. Um, they took over all the public transport. Um, it was sort of known um, as municipal socialism. Um, and they also got into rental housing. The Auckland City Council built its first houses in suburban Ponsonby in 1916, shown here, um, with other cities soon following its lead. So. Um, in Wellington, there were a whole lot of um, uh, council houses built in, in Northland, for example, suburb of Northland. In 1938, Christchurch Council pioneered a new direction, erecting the first complex of rental flats for old age pensioners. Um, and they're then, um, still there now, down in the left corner, uh, in, in Sydenham. This led to an informal distinction between state council, council housing provision and state housing provision. The former um, associated on accommodation, accommodating families, and the later on housing single and elderly people. So councils took over holding um, housing single and elderly people. Um, the state continued to build um, family-centred suburbs um, like Nainai. One reason for this, in terms of the council housing, was to rehouse elderly residents displaced by urban renewal projects in the 1950s. Um, so large areas of historic Freeman's Bay, shown um, up the left there. Um, the gasometer, for people that know Auckland, Freeman's Bay is near where the New World supermarket is now, at the bottom of um, Franklin Road. Um, um, we're flattened to accommodate a new motorway, with nearly many affected residents relocated to purpose-built pitch flats beside it. 
Inspired by modernist developments overseas, Wellington built several high-rise blocks of flats in the 1960s and 70s before reverting to lower-scale developments in the 1980s. Um, so the image on your left is um, in Freeman's Bay. You can see the first lot of pensioner housing being built there with some of the older housing behind. Um, this block of flats um, in the 1960s, not from, from where we are now, um, in Newtown. Uh, very much a modernist idea um, coming from Europe. Well, from the 1970s, councils diversified housing provision to accommodate those most in need. So again, following the central government line of maybe a more residual provision. In 2010, Christchurch City Council, as I understand it, was the single largest provider of public housing after Housing New Zealand, followed by Wellington City Council. Well, just um, in terms of conclusion, in terms of recent developments, in the early 2000s, population growth created a housing shortage, especially in large cities and resort areas like Queenstown. This led to skyrocketing prices that made housing unaffordable for many first-time house buyers. Between 2002 and 2005, New Zealand house prices increased by about 53%. Rising house prices flowed through to increased rents, further decreasing housing affordability. The long-term trend in house prices widened the wealth gap between those who owned property and those who did not. The government also supported the growth of the community housing sector. It consists of non-government organisations such as community trusts, Māori and iwi organisations and socially orientated businesses. The government's Housing Innovation Fund gave rents for such providers to buy um, community and rental housing and supply affordable home options. An umbrella organisation, I know you probably all know this, <laughs> but just in case some of you do, communi don't, Community Housing Aotearoa was set up in 2004 to provide leadership and services to the community housing sector. Finally, in terms of state housing, in 2010 the government announced that financial constraints meant that state rental housing provision would be restricted to families in greatest need. New tenants would have regular tenancy reviews to ensure their homes still best suited their housing needs. Those whose circumstances had changed would be placed in more suitable homes or evicted. The policy increased the importance of the community housing sector in providing social and affordable housing for those locked out of government, council and private provision. So, just a way of conclusion. Um, I think this very brief history of social housing in New Zealand identifies the three main ideas that we started with. One, that private enterpriser um, has un been unable to provide affordable and good quality housing, necessitating the intervention of the state, and that these types of innovation have sort of um, seesawed between direct and indirect um, uh, intervention or assistance. Well, historians also always hate making predictions, but it seems likely, with the government unable or unwilling to expand state housing supply, much future social housing provision will come from the community housing sector. Whether the sector is able to meet this challenge is no doubt something that will be debated today. Thank you. <laughs>